good morning. Just a few comments about the midterm exam. I brought it back. Um, I posted the ranking also on Moodle, and uh, I was quite pleased with the first midterm. I guess I kind of hinted at it through the two quizzes, and so most of you picked up uh, quite well. And there were a lot of 90s, and the average was about 80, the class, which is very good. Maximum was 99, minimum was 45, 45.5, something like that. And I also put the ranking based on uh, the marks that you have so far in all the assignments, quizzes, and the midterm exam under the column term. And I kind of highlighted it with the color coding. And I just want to take a minute to explain what it means. So I took the average some, somewhere around 45. And one standard deviation above the average and one standard deviation and two standard deviations below the average. So I categorize it like that. So the top that you see in green, there are about five students in that. They are clearly one standard deviation above the average. And uh, if I have to assign a grade today, I would be giving them A. Okay. And then between that point and the average itself, would be B and below the average and above one standard deviation would be C and below one standard deviation and above two standard deviations would be D and uh, finally there's probably an F in this particular case. Uh, this is just a feedback for you to know where you are and what you need to do to bring yourself up. Um, I conducted the poll just to see uh, what are the places where I can improve communicating to you? And um, I think on the whole, I feel good about the uh, response as well. Uh, a lot of the things that I'm doing seem to resonate with majority of the people. But there was one issue that I talked about in the last lecture, that is the pace of the lecture. Many people, at least one third of the class feels is not the right pace. And I presume that it means that you find it too fast or not as clear. And maybe if we can work on that, both of us, you need to help me too. I'm ready to work, but you need to help me to slow down, to ask questions. Even if we cannot formulate very uh, what you think is appropriate question, just say, Kumar, please explain that again. That's fine. And that will slow me down. And I want to bring the bottom up, third up. Um, okay, so I don't rejoice in giving. D's and F's, but you need to earn your C or B or A above, and so you need to help me. Okay? Any questions on the midterm exam or uh, upcoming midterm? There's another one coming up very soon, 28th of March, I believe. So if you guys want a quiz, like we can have a quiz before that, a week before that, uh, about 20 minutes. That will kind of prepare you for uh, what what's likely to be the focus of the exam. No comments? You guys are doing okay? Happy with the status? Go. All right. Yeah? Will we be given like the same preparation material that we give given the last midterm? Preparation material? Like quizzes for the preserving. Well, that's what I was asking. If you guys want a quiz, I was planning on one more quiz. But do you want it before the midterm or do you want it before the final? I will think about it. Okay. Um, I know that you guys catch on very well and do very well if I kind of point you in the right direction. And that was the idea of the quiz. Okay. So in one of the exams, I would want to test you on your ability to think on your own feet, where I have not kind of guided you with the reading material. That could be the second midterm, and then I'll give you a quiz before the final. Yeah. Okay, that's what I, I've been thinking. Okay, and uh, so that, that might bring down the average in the second midterm a bit. That's fine. I want to really truly sort out the A's from the B's and the C's. And that's one of my responsibilities as a, as a teacher as well. Okay. Uh, but you are always welcome to come and ask me, discuss. I will put up 
maybe another sample exam from the past so that you get an idea of what the questions will look like. How are you guys doing on the assignment number five? I posted that also last week, but it is due on the 20th, I believe, next week. Okay, so you will have time. Uh, th that assignment again would be a good preparation for your second uh, midterm as well. Not the programming part, but everything leading up to the programming, particularly the network, pipe network model, which you will see in a fluid mechanics course. And in this course, the equations are given, but you need to assemble the matrix and solve. You may not even see in a fluid mechanics course because it is considered as an advanced topic even in there. But uh, I am trying to expose you to some of the more, uh, what you would call an advanced uh, mathematical modeling tools. Okay, so I'm really glad in that sense that you guys are doing well uh, according to the first midterm. All right, and the any other questions? In the last class, I started developing, and I was going to show the MATLAB implementation of it, of a reactor model. So this you will see in a reactor course, um, maybe in the senior year. Um, it's a very simple model, one of the simpler reactor models that uh, you will see in that course. Uh, essentially, there is a second order chemical reaction that is taking place given by this rate expression how fast the reaction is taking place in each one of those reactors. And there are n reactors in series, and you have an inlet composition and a composition, the outlet composition from each one of the reactors, and then the feed rate and the volume of the reactor as design parameters or as performance analysis para parameters. And we saw that we could apply the conservation of mass rate of accumulation equals rate in minus rate or plus rate generation. Variations on these could be specifications, which we will see today, as well as changing this from steady state to dynamic. Instead of saying steady state, the reactor strain is being started from initially zero concentration. Then you will have to include the accumulation term that will convert the nature of the problem from an algebraic lumped model to a dynamic lumped model. That means you cannot use FSOL anymore, but you'd have to use ODE 4.5. Things like that are the ones that you can expect to see in an exam as a variation on the problems that you have seen. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> so we formulated this dimensionless group beta, which is k times v over f. You see k v appearing here. If I divide everything by f, divide by f, divide by f, and divide by f, then this group KV over F appears as a single number, beta. And we've always been doing this consistently. Even in the heat exchange, the pin problem, we had a one group, a dimensionless group, HPL square over KA, something like that. Okay. So in this case, there is only one variable, beta, which combines three independent variables that some of them are specifications. Okay. And then you have uh, counted the list of variables. You have beta A0 to AN, a total of n plus 2 variables. So you need to specify any two of them because we have only n equations. So that is your degree of freedom analysis which says the difference between the number of variables and the number of equations is your degree of freedom. That means you are free to choose that many variables from among the total number of variables. So in this particular case we said we will specify A0 and we will specify An. That is I am putting in certain feed concentration into the reactor and I want to achieve a certain exit concentration AM. I want to achieve a certain conversion. And questions would be, what should be the volume of each reactor to achieve that separation, the, the conversion? Okay. So beta becomes an unknown. So the unknown list then consists of everything other than the known specifications. We know that we have two degrees of freedom. We decided in one specification to say what A0 is and AN is. And so can I start recording it or? Okay. Uh, so we have n unknowns which are identified as a1 all the way up to beta. Okay. So we have the equations, we have the unknowns, and we have the parameters, and we were ready to solve it using Newton's method. Now. I'm, now I'm going to switch into MATLAB to show you how, how it is written. I actually have the function written. I started off last week with this, but in light of going slow, I'm going to try to write that function in front of you so that you get used to that idea of 
taking a problem, understanding it, and writing a function and using either f solve or Newton. We can see both today. Okay. So wh what am I going to do? I'm going to write two functions, one which calculates the unknown, which takes in the unknown vector and calculates the functions, n functions that I've identified here and returns those functions. If I have that, I can use it with f solve. But if I want to use it with Newton, I also need to write, need to write another function which takes in the same input but produces the Jacobian. Very good. Okay, we need to produce the Jacobian n by n matrix. How do I organize this thing? Okay, so some of the rationale you can see by writing this function. For example, when i is equal to 1, f1 is going to be equal to beta a1 square plus a1 minus a0. And then I will write, write the last one, fn. Okay, fn, when i is equal to n, fn is going to be beta a n square plus a n minus a n minus 1. I am taking this template and writing it out explicitly for the first reactor, for the last reactor and for every reactor in between. Why do I break it like that? The reason I break it like that is a 0 in the first equation is a known specification. Similarly, a n in the last equation is a known specification. Okay, But everything else in between for i is going to be beta a i square plus a i minus a i minus 1. This goes for i equals 2 all the way to n minus 1. Okay, This is often we encounter, we have already seen this kind of a need to break it down into kind of three subsets to write a function. Okay, So I need to write a loop for all the functions from 2 to n minus 1. The same pattern ap applies to all of them. They all have the unknowns. And the first one has A0 as the known, and the last one has An as the known. Okay, these are identified as known, A0 and An. Okay, so let's go to MATLAB. CSTR. Okay, so help me out. What would I do? Where would I start? Yeah. Function. Yes, function. Output is going to be the function f, n values, a vector of n, and I need to give it a name, cskr underscore f. You can give it any name you want, and it takes in a input vector x. And x contains the unknowns in a certain way, packed in a certain way. Okay, That starts the function. Then I'm just going to put some comments here, identifying what x contains. x contains what? x contains a0 is a known. It starts from a1, a1, a2, all the way to a n minus 1 and beta. Okay, And you can choose to organize this in any way that you like. Okay but you have to be consistent in its application. So I'm going to choose to organize it as A1, A2, all the way to A n minus 1. How do I say that? Okay, n minus 1. You just put it as A1. This really doesn't matter because this is just a comment or need to know or somebody using this program to know what it is. And then beta. Okay, and f of i, just a function that I'm writing as equal to beta times a i square plus a i minus a i minus one. A template that I know is what is computed in that function. Okay, now the actual implementation of the function begins now. Okay, so what I need to do at this stage? Define variables a0, I think I picked a value of 5, and a n, I'm not sure what I picked, let me see. You, you, can you have 0? That's a good question. Can you convert 
it's maybe possible that you convert all of the react products and reactants into products then at the re exit reactor you have no consumed uh, reactant and um, that would may that would may need that if you need infinite number of reactors to achieve that okay so i'm going to pick a number that's uh, finite and then we'll play with that number okay and let me just see what i specified I think oh, that is 0.5 okay but these are not just numbers you can have them as any number that you want a n equals 0 0.5 as a process engineer you'll be changing these numbers in designing it or in looking at the performance of an existing train so these are the two symbols that are known among the symbols in our function so we have defined them in this particular problem. Then I will start writing the function f1 is equal to um, I, I have a very poor memory so I need to keep looking at both of them. Okay, beta now do I have um, beta defined? I don't have beta defined but it is in the last position of x. So I can say beta is equal to x n. Will that work? I'm going to make a lot of mistakes and ask you to think. I'm going, this is deliberately slowing me down. If it is boring for the majority of you, you have to tell me. I can accelerate. Yeah? It should work. It should work. How many of you agree that it should work? Do we know n? We don't know the length of n. I need to say that n is equal to length of x. That way I count how many values of values are there in the vector x, then I define n. Then I say, okay, pick the last value of x and put it into beta. Okay. Now I have all the things that I need to just copy this function there. Okay. It's going to be beta times a1 square plus a1 I'm going to again ask you a question. Is it going to work? A0. I didn't define A1 or A0. Okay. This is a common problem that you can make. I'm writing the equations in one set of symbols. I need to define A1. So, or I can just call these as X. Because I know X1 contains A1, X2 contains A2. Okay. By simply use, using X1, X2, I'll be okay. Then I can write Fn, the last one, as equal to beta times beta times x n square plus x n. I'm doing it for the last one, right? Fn. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that th that is a mistake I made. Now, how do I fix that mistake? That was a genuine mistake I made. You corrected it as x n minus one. But do I really want x n minus one in that position? It is a n. It is the exit concentration a n. So I should use a n square. A n is already defined, right? So it is important whenever you make a mistake you learn from that so it is very important for you to follow all the mistakes i'm making too okay and correct me and this is a very good uh, that you ca caught me there plus a n minus what would i put x n minus very good x n minus one okay so i've defined the first function i've defined the last function and i hope there are no errors there now i need to define the intermediate ones with a loop for i equal to 2 to n minus 1. Okay. F i equals beta times x i square plus x i minus x i minus 1. End. Any questions on that function? How many of you feel this is an overkill that I could have shown you the function and moved on? Nobody. Okay. If you see value in it, the slow, that's, that's fine with me. Okay. I want to make sure that 
you are comfortable in going through that process of translating and writing the function. Any questions on any aspect of the function? So let me save that. And now you will see the advantage of built-in functions in MATLAB. If I want to use, if I say in an exam, use Newton method, you cannot stop here. You have to give me the Jacobian. But in any other course that you're solving a problem, you may not want to take all the derivatives on a fairly complicated set of functions. And so you may just use FSOL. FSOL doesn't require a Jacobian. It solves a system of uh, nonlinear algebraic equations. So let's go and try to use FSOL and see whether it works. Okay. Um, so I go to MATLAB. So what do I need to do in order to use FSOL? I need to get guess vector. So x is equal to, uh, let me try uh, 2, 1.5, 0.2, something like that. So how many reactors are there? If I put that as a my input guess vector, I have five reactors. And what are the compositions? Guesses for compositions a1 to an minus 1, those are 0.5, 0.2, I mean 2, 1, 0.5, 0.2. And then for beta, I'm giving a guess of 5. The last, the two, 2, sorry, the last variable. Okay. So now I can say f sol at CSTRF, comma, x. So equation solve, and that is the solution. How do I verify that is the true solution? CSTRF. I pass the answer back to it. What am I trying to do now? Zero. I'm trying to see how close to zero these functions are. Okay, 10 to the minus 10. Okay, so th th these are the compositions 2.2 from the first reactor, 1.29 from the second reactor, 0 0.86, 0 0.63, and then 0 0.5597 is beta. And once I know beta, I know that beta is equal to KV over F, and I know K and F, so I can calculate the volume of each reactor. So when I have five reactors, this answers the question of what should be the volume of each reactor so that I achieve the conversion starting from 5 going to 0.5, okay, moles per liter in the input to 0.5 moles per liter in the output. Now let's continue with the Newton method implementation, okay. Are there any questions on this? If I want to do for 10 reactors, what do I have to do? That's the beauty, the way that we constructed it. It's very general. If I want to do 10 reactors, I can say, there is another function called lim space. Let me show you what that does. Um, x is equal to is five comma point five comma nine comma five or two. I guess I have. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the problem. <laughs> so the function lim space basically produces a linear variation in any variable, starting with the first value, 5, ending with the last value, 0.5, producing nine numbers in that. So all these can be changed. Can, uh, instead of going from 5 to 0.5, produce nine numbers, you can say produce 19 numbers. Okay, you just have to change that. So you really don't have to worry about calculating the delta, it does all automatically all those things. So there are a lot of little functions like that that make your life easier. So in this particular case, for example, I have 20 reactors in series. Okay, and if I want to use F sol, do the same thing. Now this becomes my initial guess. Did it produce so fast? <laughs> I guess so. So there you have the reactor. Beta is much lower now. So as a process engineer, what you should look at is realize that if I use more reactors to achieve the same conversion, each of the reactors has to be much smaller in volume. Of course, as an engineer, you will then ask the question, which is more expensive? Will five larger reactors or 20 small reactors to achieve the same separation? Okay. <clears throat> and of course, you can also ask other questions. What happens if I increase the flow rate? I want to get more throughput through the call, through the reactor train. What would be the conversion? The conversion, of course, will go down. But you could answer all those questions once we have the model. Okay. Um, let's go back to the building the second function, which is the Jacobian. 
Okay, how do I construct the Jacobian for this one? I need to take the partial derivative of every one of those functions with respect to every one of those variables. So j is going to be remember as you go down the equation increases as you go this way the variables increase and the variables are packed in a particular way that is a1 a2 a n minus 1 and beta and the equations are given in this order using that information in an exam you will have to do this get me all the partial derivatives okay so in this particular case what will be the one that goes into the first position it will be the first equation with respect to the first variable 2 beta a 1 plus 1. Once I figure that out, I can then go into the coding. Okay, I can write that. What will be the second one? Zero. Again, I have this bad habit of if I hear from one person, I assume everybody understands. If you don't, please ask me. Okay. The first function contains only two unknowns. Those are a1 and beta. a0 is a known number. It does not contain a2, a3, a4. So when you take its partial derivative with respect to those variables, they will all be zeros. Except when you go to the last column, the last variable is beta. So you're taking the derivative with respect to beta. This will change when I change the specification. I'm going to give that to you as a, a kind of exercise, the thought exercise. Okay. So f1 with respect to beta would be what? a1 square. So the last column contains the number contains a1 square. So go to the next equation and all the way down to the last one. Let's maybe do the last one and then come and fill the intermediate ones because they have the same pattern. When I go to the last one, what would I get here? The last one contains two unknowns and these unknowns are a n minus 1 and beta. So when you go to the last column, it will be a n squared. If you go to the previous column, it will be? No, a n is a number that is given. Remember, a n is a constant. That's a known constant. So you're taking the derivative with respect to a n minus 1 in the column prior to this here, you're taking the derivative with respect to a n minus 1. What should that be? Negative 1. Okay. The derivative with respect to beta is a n squared. The derivative with respect to a n minus 1 is uh, negative 1. And all the other derivatives are 0. Okay. So remember that this one is j n n minus 1. And this one is j n n. The last row but the n minus 1th column. Now, if you go for any i in between, what would be the diagonal element? Derivative of f i with respect to a i. Would be 2 beta a i square plus 1, right? What would be the one to the left of it with respect to a i minus 1? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> That's very good. Somebody is paying attention. 2 beta a i plus 1 on the diagonal element. That is the derivative of f i with respect to a i. Okay. What will be the one with respect to a i minus 1? With respect to ai minus 1, it will be just minus 1. That will be below, uh, to the left of it. And everything else will be 0. And similarly, everything else on the right will be 0, except for the last one. With respect to beta, will be ai squared. So every element from the second to the n minus 1 will have three non-zero values. One below the diagonal, one on the diagonal, one on the very last one. Now, if I change the specification, from a0 a n to for example beta and a0 then the structure will completely change and it will be your job to figure that out in an exam okay i'm going to discuss that briefly after this okay
So now we have all the equations uh, figured out. We need to program this. Any questions on that? So I go to MATLAB and edit CSTRJ. Okay, so I do the same thing. Function J is equal to CSTRJX. And then I can go in here and copy a lot of these from the function and paste it there. Okay, and then I'm ready to evaluate each one of those elements in J. And J is going to be an N by N matrix, and the dimension of N is dynamic. We don't know beforehand. Okay. So we have found out for a particular case what would its length be by examining length of x. So what do I have for first line in here? I could just write explicitly j11, j1, it is the first element as equal to whatever I have here, 2 times, times beta, times x1 plus 1. Okay, So what I have done here is taken this expression that goes into J11 and accorded that. I have an error there. Beta, thank you. <laughs> and then J12, 1, 2 is equal to, well I don't need to do that because that is 0. Anything that is 0, you don't have to explicitly state it as 0. Okay, That's another nice feature in MATLAB. In most other programming languages, you'll have to initialize it, but in here it automatically initializes for you. So n is equal to x1 square. And let's do the last row. Okay, uh, j n comma n is equal to a n square. Remember, a n is a known number. Okay, and j n comma n minus one. So what I've done on line fourteen is this part, and line fifteen I'm going to put this part minus one. Okay, so j n n minus one is equal to minus one. Okay, and for the intermediate. Uh, reactors, I'm just going to set up a loop for i equal to 2 to n minus 1. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And what do I do? j i comma i, the diagonal element, is equal to, I'm going to wait for you to tell me what that is. Beta times two times x i plus one, right? Are you following me? So I'm taking this expression that is on the diagonal element two times beta. Maybe I should write it as two times beta times beta, beta times two. It's the same thing. But you see the order. 2 times beta times xi plus 1. Okay, and then j i comma i minus 1. What would that be? Negative 1. And then what would be the next one? Think again. i comma i plus 1. Do you want n? n. Because it is in the last column. Okay, the third thing is in the last column. I comma n is equal to x i square, and then end that. Okay, so that should construct your Jacobian for any number of reactors, whether you have two or twenty. The same idea would work. Any questions on that function? Now we can use this with the Newton code that we developed uh, in the previous lecture. Okay, <clears throat> if you see the Newton code, 
the we saw how we develop the algorithm for a multidimensional case okay and it's essentially x equals x minus j inverse f that is the core of the newton algorithm everything else is just preparing it for it so in the line 18 i'm calculating all the functions in line 19 i'm calculating all the jacobian in line 20 is the way where i implement the newton method the, to calculate the next best guess and then of course the rest of the algorithms we've seen many many times checking whether it is converged checking whether it has exceeded the maximum number of trials to you know, kind of get out of the program if it doesn't converge okay and uh, so the way i would use this would be newton at c s t r f comma at c s t r j comma the initial guess thank you i'm not very alert today <laughs> Uh, x comma you can put a tolerance one e to the power minus nine comma trace you can put ask it to print at every iteration okay thank you that's why I think it failed I hope not that so what do you think this means it's a common experience you must have had many times by now, right? You write a program, it doesn't work. <laughs> Matrix dimensions must agree. Matrix divide. So it is in the problem x equals x minus j backslash f. So the way that I constructed f is a, as a row vector. Okay? So that's where the problem is. Now for f solid, it didn't matter. It will take row vector or column vector because it's just a function that it tries to drive. So in here, if I put, pardon me? F transpose. F transpose. That's exactly what I need to do. Yeah. I'm hoping that's the only error, but that may not be the only one because we are just writing it together, right? It's not the only one. Uh, maybe I didn't save that one. It doesn't like that? It's now saying that minus is a function. No, no, the minus should be fine. That is the Newton algorithm. So, and th I think that the only new thing that we have, this is what you learn about the debugging process. We checked uh, uh, the function that we have written, CSTRF, with FSOL, and it works. So we know that there is no error in there. So the only addition that we have made is the Jacobian. So there is something wrong in the Jacobian function. Let's try to look at that. Uh, so what you need to do is... Which one? Line? Which line? Line 15. Should it be j i, comma, n minus 1, i, comma, n? This one, i comma n. It's because you already have j and n is equal to a n squared. It's supposed to be the last column, n. We will go in terms of, that's a good question. In terms of uh, rows, we are going from row 2 to row n minus 1. But in each one of those rows, we are putting the diagonal, the one below the diagonal, and the last column, which is the nth, nth column. Okay. So I think th there is nothing wrong in there, but the process of trying to figure out where the error is, is to set up a debug in the function and start executing it. So it stops there. So obviously we didn't encounter any error in there. There is an error I already. No, that's 21. Okay. So let's step through that. So now J has columns 1 through 11, what is x? x has 1 through 20, so what is n? 20. Okay, the, the last column here is 25, okay? So the first equation should have j11 and the very last one. We are looking at the structure, okay? And now let's go through this loop. So what would you expect j to be? the structure of J to be now, at this stage of execution. 
we have gone through the loop once i is equal to 2 right we have gone through the loop 2 so how many rows should be there how many columns should be there exactly this should have two rows and 20 columns so we can go and check that check here j j does have 2 by 20 and you can ask what are the numbers in there okay to see whether you are putting the elements in the right place so 21 and then minus 1 20 and the last one is 25 and 22 so that looks the structure so far looks fine okay and then continue executing it every time you go through the loop it will add one more row so if you look carefully i don't know whether you can see it as i'm running through this loop you will see this one go from 220 320 4, 4 by 20 5 by 20 etc okay and then you should look at the structure to see whether the numbers are going in the right place. Now it is 4 by 20. Now it's 5 by 20, you can see. 6 by 20. So let's just look at the structure of J. It is having on the diagonal and then one diagonal element below, they are all minus 1. And the very last one is decreasing. Okay, if, if you want, you can do a hand calculation to check whether the formula that you have entered is right. So that process of debugging so far seems to be okay. So the problem is somewhere else, perhaps. Let's just continue this. And I'll set up a breakpoint here just before it leaves and continue executing all of them. Okay, so one more time. Just before it goes out, I want to see what the structure is. And it is 20 by 20. So everything looks fine. So let me calculate the determinant of j. Why would I want to do that? To see if it is 0, I have a singular problem. I still have some issues, but it is it is not. Okay, the determinant is a large number. So the inverse should be fine. Okay. So now I want to step out of this. When I step out of this, it takes me back to the the Newton method. Okay, so here I have j that has come out into this function. Question. So I'm back in the Newton method. So the Newton method transferred control to the Jacobian function, which calculated, and everything seems fine. So we are back in here, and the error appears to be here. So f is now a column vector 20 by 1, and j is a matrix 20 by 20. So I should be able to calculate this function. And that's where it gives me the error. Because if x of uh, no, Ah, that's a good, good point. I made f as a column vector. J is 20 by 20, but x could be the row vector. That's it. Okay. Let's uh, let's look at x. It is. Okay. Thank you. So you get an A for discovering that error. How did it matter? It mattered because when I am making a call to Newton and making these, and x here is a row vector, and f is a column vector, so it cannot add or subtract a row vector and column vector. So in a sense, you were right. It wasn't the problem of subtraction because I'm subtracting a row vector on one side and a column vector on the other side. Okay. <coughs> Now I don't need all these breaks. <laughs> there it is. That's my converged solution and it converged in eight iterations and quadratic convergence. Note that. Okay, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. So that's the real power of Newton method. It converges very fast. It gives you extremely high accurate result with few iterations as long as you are close enough to the initial guess. So from the theory, theoretical point of view, what you should know is Newton method is guaranteed to converge if you are close enough to the root. And when it converges, it converges quadratically. You should be able to prove uh, those statements because we have seen them in class. Okay. Any questions? Now, was this exercise useful going through? 
Okay. Um, let's go back and look at a different specification and see how the problem will change. And I want you to think about it. Okay. And these are all the things that we did. Once you have beta, you can calculate what the volume is. And that's what this statement shows. That is the last solution, the last element is beta. So take that R5, R is the root where I stored that a solution, and multiply it by the reaction rate constant 0.125 and the flow rate 25. Then you can calculate what is the volume for each one of those reactors. Okay, in this case, the volume turns out to be 111 liters when you have five reactors. Now I said repeat for 10 and 20, and we have already done that. But more important repetition is, suppose V is given as 100 liters and N is 10, okay? And you are given the same value for uh, K is 0.125 and F is 25, okay? How does the problem change? Okay. Remember, what is beta? Beta is, I think, K... V divided by F. But in this case, I have given V, right? And I have given K and I have given F. So beta is now a? No, right. So AN is not known. So if I choose the reaction volume, I need to calculate what the exit composition is. Okay? So that is a performance analysis problem because an existing reactor, you know the volume, and you want to be able to predict what is the outlet concentration. In a design, you know the inlet concentration, you know what you want to achieve as the outlet concentration, you are finding what volume will do. That's a design problem, okay? So the same set of equations apply, but now the unknown vector x is going to consist of a1, a2, all the way up to an. And the knowns would be beta and a0, the inlet concentration. The inlet concentration is a p, you always know what that is, okay? So you still have the same n equations, but a different set of n unknowns. How would it change the problem? I say Newton method, use the Newton method. What would you change? Would you change the function, CSTRF? Function the function would exactly be the same set of functions, but you'll have to go back and look at um, Look at the fact that a n is now a unknown. So you take that out. Put beta in its place. Beta is a known. Right? So you need to make those changes to identify what is the new set of unknowns and what is the new set of knowns. Okay? And that will have, otherwise this function, once we have fixed these things at the initial part of the code to re rephrase what is known and what is unknown, the functions will basically look the same because it's the same function that you're solving. But what happens to the Jacobian? That's what I want you to focus on, okay? So how would the Jacobian look like for this particular specification? Remember, going down this way, we're going down equations. This way, we're going down variables. So the first position is the derivative of the first function with respect to the first variable. Will that be zero or not zero? It's going to be non zero because the function, first function has a1 in it, right? And how about, does it have a2? Does it have the last one? So it's zero. Okay. What we go to that, does everybody understand that? And what is, and you need to give me an exam, what is this de derivative as well? Okay, so what would be df1, da1? It would be 2 beta a1 plus 1, right? So go to the second equation and ask the same question. What is df2 with respect to da1? What is df2 with respect to da2? And answer that question. So what would be df2 with respect to da1? Will it be 0 or non-0? Zero? With respect to a1, it will be 0, you think? 
because you have a i minus one in each function, right? So you have a i minus one, right? So it'll be negative one. Okay, so the same thing as in the previous case, all the elements below the diagonal will be minus one, and this would be basically the same as this that you have. Okay, so you can write d f i with respect to d a i in general is two beta a i plus one. Okay, so you would fill that on the diagonal, and you would fill that on the diagonal below. How about df2 with respect to da3? That will be 0, right? So each function has ai and ai minus 1. doesn't have anything else, so it will all be 0. So what do you discover that is different in this problem than the previous problem about the structure? Last column is zero, right? I am asking. I am waiting for a smart guy to ask me an important question. <laughs> Why don't we have d f two with respect to d a n? Because that equation does not have a n. Go back to the equation. Oh, the last equation. Yeah. The last equation will have a n as an unknown, and you should have its derivative. Okay, so when you go to the, I misunderstood your question. All when I said yeah, when I said all the last column will be zero, only up to n minus one. The very last one here, d f n with respect to d a n, and d f n with respect to d a n minus 1 will not be 0. They have to be calculated. Okay. So what it says is you can actually change the loop counter from 2 to n and calculate all the elements on the diagonal and the one below the diagonal. And forget about the last column except for the very last entry. So in an exam, I expect you to give me this structure. When I say give me the structure of the Jacobian, you need to identify which ones are not 0. And then separately give me the formula that you will plug in there to evaluate. Okay, so by simply changing the specification, I've changed the structure of the Jacobian. I need to reformulate the Jacobian. I need to use the Newton method. Any questions on that problem? How many of you feel you can do it now? Not many. <laughs> I'm sure you can. It's time, right? It just takes time. <laughs> Shall we move on to the next problem or? I mean, the next ish topic, or you guys need more assistance on this one. Now, some of the things I just show you the variations, and I want you to be able to think along those variations in other problems as well. The network problem that you're doing currently, for example, I could easily change that problem from a laminar flow to a turbulent flow, changing from a linear to nonlinear problem. Okay, so in chapter 3 and chapter 4 of the book, let's kind of recap what we have seen so far, okay? In fact, uh, up to this course, we have learned quite a bit. We have learned how to formulate models and how to classify them so that we can pick the right set of tools for solving them, okay? Lump versus distributed, dynamic versus steady, ordinary differential equations, algebraic equations, boundary value problems, initial value problems. That classification is a very important one for you to be able to pick the right tool. And uh, we have then started seeing a set of tools in MATLAB on how to solve these problems. So how to formulate the problem, then we address how to solve these problems. So in there we have seen FSOL, we have seen ODE45, we have seen BVP4C. We have seen a number of other li little uh, functions along the way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now we are getting into the most, for me, the interesting part of the course where we answer the question, how do these algorithms work? So in chapter three, we basically develop these algorithms, starting from regular false size seek and bisection uh, Newton method. Okay, and we are going to continue this journey to look at how does ODE45 do, how does the BVP4C do, what are the other problems like curve fitting, functional approximations. So it's going to be a bit theoretical, but it answers at a fundamental level how do these things work, how do we make them work. Okay, but before I go into the next topic, next chapter on functional approximation. 
I wanted to spend some time introducing you to Hysis. Okay, why is Hysis important at this stage? Hysis is a process simulation tool. Okay, and once you see it, you will have a feel for how does it formulate the problem and solve using all the tools that we have used so far, and yet how easy it is to do it. Okay, and has anybody used Hysis or Aspen before? Nobody. Okay. I hope it works on my computer here. Um, the HISIS is available in chemical engineering building only, okay, because it's a chemical process simulator. And what you need to do is look for this Aspen Tech uh, process modeling, Aspen HISIS inside that. Okay. Uh, I got an email from somebody saying that FSOL doesn't work in library, right? So FSOL is part of a toolbox called Optimization Toolbox. So if they didn't license it on a university-wide license for MATLAB, then you may not have it. But I know Patrick Taylor, they should have uh, FSOL available. Chemical Engineering Building will have it available as well, okay? So if you get into problems like that, send me an email and uh, I will kind of guide you as to where you can use that. Because MATLAB has hundreds of toolboxes and they are selling each one separately, right? And uh, if you buy a student edition of MATLAB, which is only about $100, you will get the optimization toolbox. So you will get FSOL with that, you will get ODE 4.5, etc. But uh, it's not available everywhere. So when you start Aspen Hisis, this is the window that you see, okay? A blank window and you start a new case. Now, this may look, a lot of the steps involved in this may look totally bizarre in the sense you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, okay? And part of this exercise is to kind of remove that uh, um, uncertainties. So the first screen that it throws up is simulation basis manager, it says components. What do we want to do in chemical process simulations? What do we do in a, has anybody worked for a co-op term or summer term in any plant? Only one or two. So maybe you can share with us. What did you do? Um, I worked with QASF uh, in the operation plant in the diagram right now, where it's the plant that produces polyol. Polyol? Um, and then it comes with these um, bones, stuff like that. Right. And really, most of the stuff that I did is uh, visually basic uh, protein design. Okay, so you know Visual Basic very well. <laughs> That's good. Um, Excel and Visual Basic are also tools, but I think that Visual Basic, the, the available tools in MATLAB is much, much richer than what you can do with Visual Basic. But Visual Basic is available, ready-made, packaged with, uh, uh, with the Excel. So many people in industry use that. So I will introduce you to Visual Basic and how to interface Excel to MATLAB so that you can access the MATLAB functions from Excel spreadsheet because the front end could be your Excel spreadsheet which has all the data that is coming from different parts of the plant, the temperature as a function of time, concentration, pressure as a function of time. You have these data and you want to do analysis on the data, okay? So you can write your own visual basic program as he did or you can call MATLAB functions that can plot, that can uh, do analysis, statistical analysis, etc. So I spend maybe one lecture talking about that interface between Excel and MATLAB. Okay, I'm not going to talk about Visual Basic itself in this course, but um, most of the chemical plants basically produce chemicals from some raw materials. Okay, so you have to identify what sort of chemicals are there involved in a particular piece of a process equipment. What I'm going to show you is one that we have already done multi-component flash column, a very simple device, okay? And all it does is it takes a feed of hydrocarbons, probably natural gas, liquids uh, mixture, and it comes in at a certain temperature and pressure with a certain composition. And you are flashing it. You are controlling the temperature and pressure to produce two streams. Um, the flash drum is basically a cylindrical device. You dump this and adjust the temperature and pressure so that some of it goes to vapor, some of it goes to liquid. And your task is to find out what fraction goes to vapor and what are its compositions. And we have set up the model, we have used it with FSOL and F0 to solve that particular one. We are going to do the same thing in, as, uh, in HISIS so that you know that it does it without you ever seeing an equation. 
okay? And you, it does it without you calling any solver. It automatically does it for you. But the first screen that it gives you is it, it gathers information from you. What is it that you're doing, okay? So here it says identify components. What type of components do you have in your process? So if it is an entire plant, you need to identify every component that's likely to be in there and put them in this list of chemicals that are likely to be present. And that list is fairly very large. For example, if I say add, it gives me components. And if I say add, it gives me a huge list of maybe 2,000 chemicals there. I can select any one of them from that. And once you select that, it has a database from which it knows all the physical properties. It's normal boiling point. It's um, uh, Antoine factors or vapor pressure variation. Any number of critical properties, critical temperature, critical pressure, uh, things like that, it immediately knows from the data bank. So I'm going to pick, for example, methane, ethane. How do you select them? Just keep the control pressed and then select n-butane, n-pentane, for example, a five-component system, okay? And I say add these pure components, okay? And so I have identified how many components are there in my particular plant and what are those components. So I can uh, close this list. And the moment I close that list, I can enter the simulation environment, okay? Uh, fluid, yeah, the other one I need to do is fluid packages. What kind of property packages do I want to use? Okay, Property packages, again, this will look bizarre at this stage, but when you do a thermodynamics course, you will, if you remember this, you will say, oh, I can come here and get all the information I need. Okay, In thermodynamics, what do you do? You, you calculate thermodynamic properties, fugacities, things like that. So there are equations of state based property uh, predictors, modelers, and we have actually in the textbook an example of Peng Robinson equation of state to predict, for example, the density of carbon dioxide or ethane or propane. That's an example we have not used in this particular uh, term, but you should be familiar with. So I select, I've selected the components and I need to select the property packages. And there are a number of property package models. These are all models, okay? So the one that is commonly used for hydrocarbons is called the Peng Robinson equation of state. So I'm going to select that, okay? So once I've selected that, it immediately tells me number of components, NC is five, and then I'm using the Peng Robinson equation of state to do my simulation. Now I enter the simulation environment. So once I enter the simulation environment, it gives me the PFD diagram, okay? This is where I construct the process flow sheets, process flow diagram. And all you see, uh, what you see on the right-hand side is a whole range of process units that you're likely to see in a refinery. Pumps, heat exchangers, distillation columns. And all you need to do is grab one of them. So I'm going to grab the se separator and place it there. What does it do? What does HISIS do at this stage? It immediately knows this is a separator. That means it knows the model behind it. Okay. Um, so the, this is essentially an equation assembler and an equation solver, but behind the scenes. All you need to do is take that and put it onto the screen, and now you have uh, a separation unit as an example. Okay, and then you can have many such units. Maybe we can expand it to uh, two stages later on, but let's just do a one, one separation unit. So the blue line is called a material stream. So any process unit will have things coming into it, things going out of it. it takes some feed and produces certain products. Right? And along with the stream, it takes material and it takes energy because it comes in with a certain temperature. You may be cooling it, taking some of the energy, it goes out with a different amount of energy. Right? So you need to identify the material and energy streams. And these are done with these two arrows. The blue one is for material stream, the red one is for energy stream. So you select the material stream and add that. One of them. And this one is going to have two. So I'm going to put number two. And it also labels, as you can see, my process unit is called V100, and my stream is called stream 1, stream 2, and stream 3, okay? So I have put all the elements that I need, now I need to connect them, okay? So how do I connect them? I go to this, and I guess I go to the connection mode, okay? When I go to the connection mode, and this I go through very quickly, so you may not remember when you go in front of HISIS how to do it, but so you may have to replay and look at it. So, but there is a connection attach mode. The moment I click that, 
the more changes instead of assembling the units and linking up the units. Okay, so I go to the first one for example. Oh, I guess I turned it off. Observe what happens. It shows a blue dot. Okay, that's an output, and I click on that, and then I drag, and as I drag to this one, it says I can attach it to it because it, the blue one lights up. So I release my bounce, and it is attached. Okay, so that is now the input to the flash drum. Similarly, there is a blue dot here which says a vapor product. So I click on the mouse and then drag and go to this and I attach. Okay. That's it. Okay, so I have now construct a very simple, very elementary process flow sheet. And I have identified what is the input. Well, there is one input and there are uh, two outputs. So I, now I need to define what is in the input stream. What are the temperature, pressure, composition, etc. So I go and double click on that. It opens up a form and I specify what are the inputs there. Okay, for example, if I go to compositions, it already tells me methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane. That's the components that are in there, but it doesn't know how much there is. So I can put in a number, 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. This could be anything. I'm just making up some numbers, okay? You would actually know the gas plant composition, for example, from a plant, and you will enter the actual numbers, okay? And you can express these in any number of units. This is really where the power is. You can say these are mole fractions, these are mass fractions, these are molar flow rates, etc. Okay, there are many options, but I will leave it to more fractions as a default. Okay, so I have defined all the compositions. Okay, condition. What is its condition? What is its temperature? What is its pressure? Okay, or you can choose to specify what is the fraction of that feed that is in vapor form. So you have to now you need to know again a degree of freedom analysis. So which we did for the I don't think we did it for the flash drum case, but it is in the book that you should study that. So that degree of freedom analysis will tell you how many conditions can I specify for the feed, how many conditions can I specify for the flash drum. Until you specify, those, the degree of freedom analysis is also done automatically for you by ISIS. So it knows for this flash drum, you need to give me all these inputs. Otherwise, I cannot solve the problem because I don't have enough information. Number of equations, number of unknowns must match, right? Only then it can solve. So until then, it will give you a hint, unknown temperature. Okay, it says unknown temperature, you go and put in a temperature, maybe uh, 25 degrees Celsius or maybe minus 20 degrees Celsius, whatever that is. You can change the temperature too, the units of the temperature if you like. The moment you enter that, it says, okay, you have given me temperature but unknown pressure. Okay, so I need to go and specify a pressure. All the data will come from real data in a plant. Here, I'm just making it up. Okay, so I'm going to put one atmosphere. One atmosphere is... How many kilopascals do you know? 101 kilopascals. Or if you want to just specify in atmosphere, you can do that too. Specify as uh, atmosphere and change the number to one. No, it's one kilopascals. That's not true. One atmosphere. So it converts it to 101 kilopascals automatically. Okay. Unknown flow rate. So it kind of guides you. If you look at the yellow line, this is where it tells you what is unknown in this process flow sheet. Okay? The moment you specify the last specification, it just runs immediately, solves the problem, probably predicts what the outputs are. Okay? So in here, the unknown flow rate is, I'm just going to say one kilomole. Oops. What did I do? Flow rate is one kilomole per hour. Okay, it's done. Okay? So let's look at what is available. Oh, I need to specify the operating conditions of the column. So I specified the feed and uh, in fact, I should show you one more thing. So remember, I specified the temperature, pressure, the flow rate, but immediately it calculates the state of that particular feed. The compositions is, are all equimolar, 0.2, and if the temperature is minus 20 degrees and the pressure is 101, then the vapor, that feed is going to consist of 70% vapor and 30% uh, liquid. How do I know that? It immediately calculates it there. It shows me in the first row what fraction is vapor and at that temperature. But what I need to do is specify what is the temperature in the flash drum. 
okay one so parameters okay so here inlet delta p the delta p is the pressure drop so it's coming at one atmosphere so i want to reduce the pressure to a lower level i need to specify what is the delta p or you can specify the vapor outlet pressure okay so you will really appreciate the power of uh, ISIS as you do other courses where you learn what the model is, how to go about specifications of various types. In this course, we are just focusing on building the models and solving the models using a variety of ways. ISIS happens to be one of them. Okay. Um, so the pressure drop is zero. Let me just increase that to 10 kPa. Okay. And now ask what is the okay what is the composition on the top for example it's 28 percent methane 27 percent ethane 0 0.05 percent and pentane and pentane is the heaviest material so very little goes to the top okay but if you go and examine what happens in the bottom you will see that the composition is n pentane is 55 percent in the bottom okay the mole fraction and methane is being very light, so only 0.2% of methane goes to the bottom. So you can now start analyzing the process operating conditions. How can I achieve a desired separation that I want by simply changing the parameters? Behind the scene, it calculates the k-values. For example, we saw when we were using the flash equation, we needed the k-values. Here are the k-values. K values are not constants, they are functions of composition, temperature, and pressure. So the model that Heisel uses is actually much more rigorous than the model that we used, where we assume K values to be constant, independent of composition. Okay. So it is really a very powerful tool. It uses all the algorithms that we have seen so far in this course and actually gives you very powerful process units like a distillation column, for example. Okay. So here it is. This is an absorption co distillation column, a reflexed absorber column, an absorption column. These are multi-stage columns with 20, 30 trays and thousands of equations. And it assembles those equations and solves it for you. Okay. Any questions on that? Are you impressed with it? If not, when you use it, you will realize how powerful it is. Particularly when you have to do it by yourself by hand with MATLAB. You will say, why do I need to do this if I can get a better answer from um, ISIS uh, and similar process simulators? There are a number of them. Okay. Any questions? I will give you one example in an assignment on using ISIS so that you get to uh, practice with it. But that's all I'm going to introduce to you about ISIS. It's a much more powerful tool. It can do some process control, it can do dynamic simulations, etc. But our purpose in this course is different, so uh, that's all about ISIS. There are no questions. We'll close that. And uh, all right. So <clears throat> the next topic is going to be an important topic for chemical engineers. That is curfitting. Okay, we, we gather a lot of data in the laboratories that controls some input variables and measures some output variables. <coughs> it could be concentration <coughs> as a function of feed rate, for example, to calculate the reaction rate expression. The expression that we saw, for example, the rate of reaction as Kv times Ai squared. So in developing that, uh, the, that correlation, we need to find out what the rate constant is. So this reaction rate is nothing but dA dt. So we will do an experiment where we will measure the concentration as a function of time in a reactor. So we have a feed and we are putting a product and we are calculating the, observing the measuring the concentration and plotting that concentration as a function of time. And then we can take the slope to get the left hand side dA i dt. So we know both the concentration and its slope. So we know the right hand side, the concentration, we know the reactor volume, we can calculate the slope, so we can estimate what this rate constant is. 
So this chapter is about such curve fitting exercises to estimate rate constant, estimate parameters and represent functions. In general what it is is we want to construct a function that represents a set of data points. If you give me a set of data points, how do I represent it by a function? This problem goes back to uh, in astronomy, for example, people were just observing the position of the planets before they could build models. Kepler's law was based on a lot of observations of planetary positions over a period of time. And Newton's law was a generalization of the Kepler's law. So in a similar sense, as we saw in the very first lecture of this course, there are a lot of models that are based entirely on empirical observations. There are models that we build based on conservation laws. And then there are models that we build based on empirical observations. And how do we represent such empirical observations in terms of functions, functional representations. So this whole chapter is about functional approximations. Okay. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about the two types of problems that we will encounter and then we will build the ideas in the next class. So the first type of problem is if you are given a function f of x, okay, it can be a very complicated function represented by a simpler version, a polynomial pn of x. Okay. <clears throat> Why would you want to do that? A simple question, you have a calculator, okay, you take a calculator and you press e to the power x. How does it calculate e to the power x? It has a series expansion, which is a very complicated series. And we have seen one uh, example where you need to decide how many terms you need to take in that series to give you a certain accuracy because it's a series that is converging slowly for some values of x. Okay, So we want to take that function and represent it by maybe a polynomial approximation so that we have only a finite number of terms. It simplifies the calculations. That's one type of problem that we will see where a given function is complicated but we are going to approximate it by a simpler function, a polynomial function. The second set of problems where we need to have this functional representation is given a set of data x i y i that comes from an experiment, build a function that function that, uh, that acts as y as a function of x. So given a set of data, how do I find what this function is? And we will answer both these questions uh, maybe I think starting in the next class. So that's the place to stop for today. So please take your uh, midterm exam. And if you have any questions on those, feel free to come and see me. Those should be pretty obvious the way that I have marked because I have laid out clearly what the points are for each question. And also the solution is posted on uh, Moodle. So you can compare it to the inside. Are you going to like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I finished part one of the homework. Good. When I got the answer, um, it only showed the four p uh, values, but didn't show the small ones because the p value was so much larger. Than yeah, the yeah, yeah. That's so. When I clicked on x, it showed me that it was like Actual point zero. Right. It's so in the seventh decimal place or something. So it just shows zero. So how do you you can do format long. If you just enter a command format long, and every time it prints out any numbers. Uh, it will print it in the long format, which will be 16 digits okay. or so. Right. That's the easiest fix for that. Okay. Otherwise, you can use fprintf, there you can control the precision of the display. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question about this problem. Um, how many labor fractions are there going to be? Like, is each of these like a different set? Of no, 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 no. The, this, is a, this is the functional approximation problem. So the ki is given by an equation. So these are the numbers that go into that Yeah, equation. so I calculated ki and I used all those. And so I got ki for this one, this one, and this one, right? Okay. Is, yeah. Okay, so then how many liquid and vapor fraction But There's only one. There's only one because you are given this is the three component system. These are the three compositions. And that's the temperature and pressure. So you need to take that temperature and put it in here. And calculate the k values. Yeah, I right? did that right. Once you have that, use those k values here and uh, in this one. Okay, and calculate psi. Psi is only no. Okay. So, there, so there's now, only one psi. There is only one psi. Okay. For each case, there's only one psi. In the first problem, psi is the unknown because t is given. Right. In the second problem, t is the unknown because psi is given. Okay. okay. Psi is 50%. 
So T is the unknown. So you need to search for T. So is this, is it K times T or is it like... No, K as a function of T. Okay, that, that's what I thought. K as so a function. So in here, you actually need to plug in that, that expression. So oh, we what, put that in. You put that expression so that it, uh, T appears in that. And then you can search for T. F solve oh. can search for T. The best way to do it is write a small function that K takes in T and spits out K. Okay. And then you can use it here. You can use it there in the first problem and in the second problem. Okay, so when you use f you have functions that are brought to zero, so that would be one of them? That is the only function that's brought to zero. Oh, okay. That's so the only function that's brought to zero. Once you, no, you can use that later on. After you know what psi is, you use... Oh, so you, you solve, it. so the f solves for psi, and then you plug that in to get your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you So have in the first case, the t is known, right? So uh -huh. you know all the k values. So psi is the only unknown, solve for okay, it, I see, I see. and use the psi there, and you know the k value, so you can calculate x and y. In the second problem, you know psi, but you need to solve for the t unknowns implicitly that are appearing here. And again, you solve only this, and search for okay. t, so that satisfies this equation. Once you know the t, take that t and calculate the k values. Oh, and then with the k, then you calculate Yeah, the because psi okay. is known. So, so how many x values will you have? You'll have one for this, 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 yeah. and then three y values. Three values. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you so much. I'll be in my office all day. I have a class from 8 30 on. Before that, I should be. Okay, thank you.